In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Where your heart is, there is your treasure. Our treasure is how often our Lord spoke of the field with a treasure hidden in the field. And the kingdom of heaven is like that, the one who sold, sold all he had to buy that field and he gained that treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price. And how often our Lord speaks of this, the kingdom of heaven being compared to many things and the, the, the casting of the net off the ship of St. Peter and drawing in all the fish. And who is this treasure? What is this treasure? What is, the, what is it that makes the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of heaven? And it is the most blessed trinity. And this treasure that is given to us, that took on flesh, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is, is a historic event that He became man. He was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. He was crucified on Mount Calvary. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. This is not a fiction. And that's why it's such a crime. Since the time of the Protestant Revolution and uh, politically applied in the French Revolution, the, the whole New World Order which rejects our Lord Jesus Christ. But before the Protestant Revolution and the, the Masonic French Revolution slash American Revolution, because it's the same principles, it was the one world order of Jesus Christ the King. That's what is called Christendom. When all men recognize that fact, God became man. And He didn't come down to play games. He came down to bring salvation, the true salvation, he established the true church. He poured out the, the grace of his sacred heart and his five wounds through the seven sacraments. And that's why always the heart of every city was the altar where the sacrifice of the mass takes place. And people in every town, every city, every nation were used to seeing their, the soldiers of the country kneeling at the altar. The knights who would spend the, the night all night long before they made their vows in the hands of the bishop. And the political leaders, kings, dukes, were always centered around the altar. And you, you have expressed that revolution, a man against God, when Napoleon Bonaparte was crowned by the Pope and in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And his action shows the whole new modern world. And that is Napoleon, a man who, all right, he has a higher position, he's to lead, but he's still a man. He's clay, dust, and ashes, like all of us. What does he do? He snatches the crown out of the hand of the Pope and crowns himself. That action really shows the modern world. We will not have this man reign over us, Jesus Christ the King. And that's why Pope Pius IX, in the Syllabus of Errors, he's not listing a bunch of liturgical errors. Don't use this incense, these are wrong vestments for such and such a Mass. You're not going to find that. He lists all the errors of modern civilization that are condemnable in God's eyes. And the Syllabus of Errors is, is infallible. It has the full authority of the Holy Ghost and the Roman Pontiff behind it. And it completely opposes the modern world. That is why we cannot fit in this modern world. We are aliens on this earth, we Catholics. We must be, as our Lord said, in this world, live by the charity of His commandments, but not of this world. Because our mind and our thoughts, our conversation is to be in heaven, says St. Paul. So we are only pilgrims on this earth. And the Catholics have always, always striven in their good way, in a very um, determined, charitable, but firm way to establish the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ in our own souls, which is a, a lot of work already. It's a lifetime work 
to establish Christ in our soul, in our intelligence, in our, in our will, in our heart, in our whole being, and in our families, and in our cities, in our nation. And it's just so normal that Christ be king, that he be acknowledged by all the leaders of the political order. It's so normal that our economic structures be respecting the laws of God, of justice and charity. And it's just twice as normal that women be women and men and as men be men. But all this now, since the French Revolution president, it's all upside down. So it's really no surprise that we are to have mass, you know, in different places. In barns, houses, living rooms, basements, hotel rooms. We're back to the 70s in a way. But it shouldn't be as so big of a surprise. The big surprise really is that we're not being arrested yet. We're not being hunted down yet. As has happened in England, in Scotland, in uh, French Revolution France, and in Ukraine under communism, and in Poland and China, and by the Freemasons in Mexico. That's the surprise. That's the surprise. So, dear faithful, I want to share with you a really great treasure that Archbishop Lefebvre often referred to and you don't hear too much about, but here it is, and it's written by Pope, the great Pope Pius VI. He wrote this encyclical uh, eight years after the Synod of Pistoia in 1786. The Council of Pistoia was Vatican II appetizer. He wrote this encyclical August 28, 1794. Oh, Father, that's way long time ago. It has nothing to do with our modern world. Yes, it does. And you'll see how. Here we go. He first mentions the Synod of Pistoia. How this was gathered together by a bishop in France. A bishop that he elevated that he trusted, and this bishop started to play with the Catholic faith. And he gathered together this council of his priests and other bishops, and they departed from the faith. And so this Pope says something has to be done about it. And we waited impatiently that he would correct his errors, but seeing this bishop will not do it, then I have to step in and use my apostolic authority, says the Pope, to clean this confusion. Because otherwise, I will sin before God, he says, if I don't correct doctrinal errors. You see, the great, as Archbishop Lefebvre used to say, the faith, and he quotes St. Paul, the faith is the submission of our intelligence to what God has revealed. So we don't improve on the, on the doctrines of the faith. They're given to us from God, revealed by Christ to the Apostles and they're handed down. That's called public revelation. So it's given down in our catechism. Before coming to Mass here, uh, we stopped at the museum here in St. Mary's. You got a little treasure of a museum here. You got the chalice of Father de Smet, pictures of the old altars, and in there is a catechism written by hand by <coughs> one of the early Jesuit priests, who's probably buried here in the cemetery, and if there it is, our catechism, and this is written in mid-1800s, our catechism that we believe and uphold all the time. Catholics cannot change this faith. And he taught this to the Indians here, that's, and he put it in their language. Our faith doesn't change. It's always the same, always beautiful, always victorious, always the same because God doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the faith is to be handed down. And, and, and our Lord, how often he said that we must receive the faith like little children, right? And this is what we got to fight for. The revelation that cannot be played with, compromised, and changed. And that's why Pope Pius IX said, those who say that the Catholic faith must adapt to modern civilization, that the Pope has to adapt to modern civilization and change the dogmas and catechism to fit the modern world, let him be condemned. It's the world that has to conform to Jesus Christ the King, not 
Jesus Christ the King to this fickle world. So listen to these great words of this Pope, and it applies now more than ever. Quote, they knew the capacity of innovators in the art of deception. In order not to shock the ears of Catholics, the innovators sought to hide the subtleties of their tortuous maneuvers by the use of seemingly innocuous words. In other words, use harmless words that seem harmless, that sound Catholic, but they're deadly such as would allow them to insinuate error into souls in the most gentle manner. Once the truth had been compromised, they could by means of slight changes or additions in phraseology distort the confession of the faith that is necessary for our salvation and lead the faithful by subtle errors to their eternal damnation. So you see, this Pope is... He's a Catholic Pope, and he's got his head on straight, and he knows that if you play with doctrine, you're going to fall into error and, and damn your souls. And this is the business of eternal souls. This is not about airplanes, about building bridges, about the, the quality of food, which people would get upset about. If an engineer said, yeah, I built this brand new modern bridge according to the modern principles. Two plus two is seven. That's the principle on which I built this bridge. No one's going to drive on it. So all the more it's so important that the Catholic doctrine be clearly kept. And this bishop of Pistoia introduced novel terminology, but he used old Catholic words. This is so... We're living through this. Here, here I continue. This manner of, dis, of dissimulating or lying is vicious regardless of the circumstances under which it is used. For very good reasons, it can never be tolerated in a synod or council of which the principal glory consists above all in the teaching the truth with clarity and excluding all danger of error. So here you have the condemnation of Vatican II back in 1794. Vatican II condemned also, the doctrinal declaration and all those fuzzy interviews of Bishop Follet condemned you don't play with the Catholic faith and give fuzzy language with the Catholic faith. And even Bishop Follet admitted that. The doctrinal declaration, he says, if you look at it with pink sunglasses, like a liberal mind, a modernist, you're going to say, hey, it's acceptable. And if you look at it with dark sunglasses, that is traditional Catholic thinking, you're going to say it's acceptable. And in God's eyes, God despises and he hates the double-tongued. So pray for Bishop Follet that he doesn't die without condemning that doc declaration that he signed. Because I know if I signed it, I'd go straight to hell. That's how grave this is. And this also condemns those four lays on comments. That give fuzzy language about the new mass, that it gives grace, and the fuzzy language about um, Vatican, the, the council nourishing your faith, that the, the, the new church can uh, feed your soul, that it gives grace. This kind of language is condemned. It is. So this good Pope, and he set the stage for what was coming. Listen to this next paragraph. Moreover, if all this is sinful, it cannot be excused. In the way what one sees, it, the way it's being done, under the erroneous pretext that the seemingly shocking affirmations in one place are further developed along traditional lines in another place, and even in yet other places corrected. <laughs> as if allowing for the possibility of either affirming or denying the statement, or of leaving it up to the personal inclinations of the individual, such as always been the fraudulent and daring method used by innovators to establish error. It allows for both the possibility of promoting error and of excusing it. This is incredible. He's condemning all this fuzzy language. 
where it sounds like they're talking about traditional mass, traditional doctrine, we're against errors, but at the same time, the new mass is legitimate, the new mass gives grace, the new mass has miracles. That kind of language is condemned by the church. We're not allowed, especially priests and bishops and popes, we're not allowed the church teaching to use fuzzy language. And that's why that catechism written by that Jesuit priest in 1840-whatever is very clear language. Who established the church? Our Lord Jesus Christ established the church. What are the, how do we know the true church? We know the true church by the four marks. One holy Catholic apostolic. That's why St. Pius X said the greatest antidote against modernism is our simple catechism. So, let me bear on your patience a little more. This is good wine, so I hope you enjoy it. But it's, this is so powerful, and this has been forgotten. And this really, you know, Bishop Bishop Williamson, Bishop Bishop Four also, Bishop Fillet, they need to reread this and worry about feeding the flock the true doctrine and not confusing them and not causing civil war among the resistance and those trying to keep the faith over issues and questions that shouldn't even be discussed. You don't discuss about abortion among Catholics. There's no discussion. You don't discuss about the new mass giving grace. There's just no discussion. It does not give grace. And Archbishop Lefebvre settled that question umpteen years ago. He said it very clearly. The new mass does not give grace because it is perverse. It's a sacrilegious use of the sacred things. And it's built to please Protestants, built by Protestants, for Protestants. Let me quote some more. Here's your second pouring, okay? It is, it is as if the innovators pretended that they always intended to present the alternative passages, especially to those of simple faith, who eventually come to know only some part of the conclusions of such discussions, which are published in the common language for everyone's use. Or again, as if the same faithful had the ability on examining such documents to judge such matters for themselves without getting confused and avoiding all risk of error. It is a most rep reprehensible technique for the insinuation of doctrinal errors and one condemned long ago by our predecessor, St. Celestine. And he's quoting here St. Celestine the first who found it used in the writings of Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius. Remember, Nestorius denied that Mary was the mother of God, because he said in Christ there was two persons, a human person and a divine person, which is heretical. We know by the Catholic faith there's only one person in Christ, that's the divine person, and two natures. So he says Nestorius was the first to use this double ambiguous, fuzzy language, and which he exposed in order to, to this Pope condemned it with the greatest possible severity. Once these texts were examined carefully, the imposter was exposed and confounded, for he expressed himself in a plethora of words, mixing true things with others that were obscure, mixing at times one with the other in such a way that he was also able to confess those things which were denied, while at the same time possessing a basis for denying those very sentences which he confessed. <laughs> In order to expose such snares, something which becomes necessary with a certain frequency in every century, no other method is required than the following. And here, here's what's needed. Whenever it becomes necessary to expose statements that disguise some suspected error or danger under the veil of ambiguity, ambiguity is fuzzy language, one must denounce the perverse meaning under which the error opposed to Catholic truths is camouflaged. In other words, when anyone speaking fuzzy about the Catholic faith, and it sounds not right, and it sounds there's Catholic in it, but there's something wrong about it, the whole thing is bad, he says and you must detect the errors and condemn it. He's condemning Vatican II documents way, way long ago. 
And then uh, this good Pope Pius the Sixth. He says, um, obviously, he says we want this Bishop of Pistoia to renounce his errors. We want him to. We treated him gently to come along and and renounce his errors, but he didn't, and he stubbornly refused. And so he had to write this encyclical condemning the Council of Pistoia. And he will list, with this comes 80 propositions that were laid down by the Council of Pistoia, which were all condemned. And there's a lot of errors in there that were repeated at Vatican II. And then towards the end of this, this bowl, it's actually a papal bowl, B-U-L-L, he concludes saying this, It is not a matter of the danger of only one or another diocese. So when a bishop speaks heresy or error, it's not about, all right, there's danger to his diocese. Listen to this. Any novelty at all attacks the universal church. Any novelty at all attacks the whole church. Any wolf breaking through the fence attacks the whole flock. And that's why these good popes, they use their authority to condemn heresy and error. Thank God. But now these, these last Vatican II popes, they, they swim in, in the, the modernist errors. <clears throat> so if any bishop says anything favorable about the heresies of Vatican II, they attack the whole church. If any of the bishop says anything favorable about the new mass, they attack the whole church. And that goes for all of us priests too. Because Vatican II is so imbued with modernism, subjectivism, all the heresies. Yes, there may be some good words in there, but the words feed the poison. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said in his great declaration, even though not every sentence in Vatican II may be heretical, formally heretical, yet the whole thing is bad because it's soaked in heresy. So I repeat, it is not a matter of the danger of only one or another diocese. Any novelty at all assails, attacks the universal church. And he's quoting Pope St. Celestine I. Now for a long time, from every side, the judgment of the Supreme Apostolic See had not only been awaited, but earnestly demanded by unremitting, repeated petitions. So people were begging the Pope, you've got to do something about this. This is confusing the people, that there's, there's civil war, there's upheaval, you've got to do something. In saner days, we could appeal to the Pope right now and say, settle this question, please. And a good Pope, and, and there will be someday another good Pope, who will condemn Vatican II, condemn all the errors on the new Mass and those who pat it on the back, condemn all the errors of Vatican II and, and all of its reforms. So we wait for that day. In the meantime, we got to patiently battle out, pray our rosary, long and pray and do sacrifices for the Pope, a good Pope finally to consecrate Russia. God forbid, he continues, and I close, God forbid that the voice of Peter ever be silent in that holy see, where living and presiding perpetually, he presents the truth of the faith to those in search of it. A lengthier forbearance in such matters is not safe, because it is almost just as much of a crime to close one's eyes in such a case as it is to preach such offenses to religion. In other words, if I am silent as Pope, he says, I, I commit a greater crime. So the crime of these last five Popes of Vatican II are great, because they attack the whole church. I continue, he closes here, Therefore, such a wound must be cut away, a wound by which not one member is hurt, but the entire body of the church is damaged. And with the aid of divine piety, we must take care that with the dissensions removed, the Catholic faith be preserved inviolate, and that those who, whose faith has been proved may be fortified by our authority once those who defend perverse de teachings have been recalled from error. And then he invokes the Holy Ghost, he condemns ambiguity again, and closes his introduction to the 80 errors he will condemn. 
So he also says in this sentence, you can see those who are fighting for the faith stay strong because someday God will bless you and you will be, heaven will reward, heaven will congratulate your perseverance when we finally get a good Pope that condemns Vatican II, condemns all these errors, it's, it will happen. It's going to happen. And we wish it sooner than later. But in the meantime, this great encyclical of this Pope, Pius VI, condemning ambiguous language, <clears throat> and language that misleads, and even is combined with a lot of truth. And we have to apply this to Vatican II, and it condemns Vatican II, you have to apply this to the Vatican II within the SSPX in 2012, the Doctrinal Declaration. This encyclical condemns it. And then you got to apply it to the four lays on comments, five of them rather, uh, that speak fuzzily about grace of the new Mass and its confusing souls and misleading many good souls. Regardless of who wrote them, all of it is condemned already. It stands condemned. And I beg you, pray for these bishops. These bishops were consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre not to play games with the faith, not to compromise it, and not to cause disturbance and weakness and loss of faith among the faithful and fights over questions that have been settled a long time ago, like the new mass giving grace. And you can read Father Pulvermacher back in the 1970s in his, his request his answers to the questions in the Angelus magazine. And he says, of course the new mass does not give grace. Our Lord says, judge by the fruits. What are the fruits of the new mass? Empty seminaries, empty convents, loss of faith, abandoning the Catholic doctrine, immorality, the priests, goofballs, have no idea what they're ordained to be and do. And he says, the fruits tell you there are no grace in the new mass. And of course, in addressing Hugh Wakens when he attacked us recently, pray for him because he's a really good man, but I think he's mistaken on this, obviously. And uh, of course, if you pray, St. Alphonsus says this, if you pray to the heart of our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, if anyone prays, God will, will always hear the prayer, especially of the poor, especially of the sinful, of those who are repentant for their sins. There is no one God is going to refuse. Even if a Muslim gets on his knees and turns to the true Christ the King, God will give him the grace to convert to the true religion. But to say because of that, that you, you, the new mass gives grace? No way. God, the new mass does not give the grace. And you can judge by the fruits. And Archbishop Lefebvre said it very often himself, and these quotes are out there, uh, and he speaks very clearly, it does not give grace. The not modernists have shut down the fountains of grace. So dear faithful, you must persevere. These are great days we are in. They are, these are the days very similar to the early persecutions of the church. When to hold the Catholic faith, they had mass, during the Aryan crisis in homes like this, they had to flee for their lives. Many of them were put to death. And most of the bishops went with it. Most of the priests went with it. Most of the faithful went comfortably with the heresies. And now we're dealing with modernism, which is infecting the ranks of Catholic tradition. <clears throat> so the disease of Vatican II goes on. It just goes on. Remember Pope Benedict XVI said, the problem is Vatican II has not been fully implemented. <laughs> That's why the church is not flourishing. And then Pope Francis, just last week, he put out a new document calling for all the contemplative novice ordo nuns to get in step with Vatican II. Now they have to abandon and completely change their their statutes and their constitutions, which they already did at Vatican II already, but now they have to become worldly. The, the contemplative orders are being completely smashed. 
And, and Bishop Fillet dares to say that this pope is actually traditional, favorable to tradition. So in Bishop Fillet in his conference, you heard him, uh, he said, uh, this is not a trap, this personal prelature, it's not a trap. <laughs> I mean, I should be weeping, really. I should be weeping because it's, the blindness is, is unbelievable. And he says, no, there's no way the enemies, if they were enemies, they would never seduce us with a personal prelature and canonical, canonical setup and all this. But you know as well as I, dear faithful, the, the foxes would gladly tell the chickens, you know, of course, come in as you are. Come as you are. And imagine the chickens saying, well, surely the foxes mean us no harm. Surely the foxes are not setting a trap. And Archbishop Lefebvre, he knew the modernists. He understood their wickedness and their maneuvers. That's why when he, he could see eye to eye with Cardinal Ratzinger, and he said, this man is a modernist, he is not honest, and we cannot trust him. Archbishop Lefebvre said those words. Was he being mean and lacking in charity? No, when you're at war, especially the biggest war, which is the faith, you got to call a wolf a wolf. We're not in the game of niceness when it comes to you and I possibly going to hell forever. And those you love and those you, you and our enemies too, we must wish and desire the salvation of all. But it cannot be through false ecumenism and trad ecumenism which is now, now being purported now to everybody. <clears throat> Trad ecumenism. Everybody fits in. <clears throat> and now uh, even the USML in France, the, 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 the priestly committee that they built in 2014. It's a democratic union of priests. And they recently said, <clears throat> put out a, a, a statement saying that uh, they don't have a leader. They don't want a leader. Everything's going to be by consent of the priests working together like a big community, um, a big committee, a democratic committee. But that's not how Christ instituted the church. So dear faithful, fight on with your rosary in your hand and the sword of the Spirit in your other hand. The sword of the Spirit, which is to know well your catechism love the truths of the faith, and know well the teachings of the Catholic Church, the great encyclicals. I just quoted from Octorum Fidei, Pius VI. Well, you got Pius IX, Syllabus of Errors, Pius X, Bashendi, and Lamentabile. You've got Leo XIII, all his great encyclicals, Pius XI, Condemning Ecumenism, Mortali Manimos, and uh, on the Kingship of Christ, Quas Primas, the condemnation of Pius XI of communism, <clears throat> Pius XII also condemning the, the modern errors and atheistic evolution and scientific evolution. He condemns all this. So by condemning the disease, you protect the health of the body. That's why people run the doctors, right? The doctors point protect them from the disease, or they're supposed to, to protect the health of the body. And this is very important for us to remember when the church levels out her condemnations, is to protect the whole body, the mystical body of Christ. And that's the true love of a good shepherds. So let's pray, dear faithful, and persevere. These are, uh, these are tough days, we all know that, we all suffer, but doesn't matter. Let's just look at Christ crucified and put ourselves under the mantle of the Virgin Mary, consecrate ourselves to her, and she will help us all persevere. And then you and St. Mary's, you, you, you know all these good families here, all these good priests. I know these good priests. And uh, they know better. They shouldn't be going along with this. They shouldn't. They need to read this encyclical. Maybe we could pass it out to them somehow. But do pray, and in our hearts we should wish that the conversion of these good people back to the real fight of Catholic tradition.
So let's continue and let's pray in this Mass for a strong faith like the martyrs. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.